Welcome everybody to another episode of the Bookum Nook Show. My name is Kyle Colley, and this is an episode of Founders Talk Podcast, a podcast about learning about the lessons and uh, achievements of founders, writers, and authors. Today, we have a special guest, uh, Laura May Malin. She has over 25 years of, of experience in the, in the uh, indus entertainment industry. She has been a script doctor, a collaborator, an executive producer, a show a runner, a distributor, a co-writer for over 50 films and television shows. She has written thrillers as an author, as, and she's written dramas, biographies, epic sagas, and even children's books. She is the founder of Mayland Entertainment, an entertainment consulting company dedicated to creative development, sales, co-production, marketing, and uh, positioning of films and TV uh, series. Um, our guest today is Laura Malin. Welcome to the, uh, the show. Did I miss anything? Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. No, that's impressive. Not even I remember all the things that you just said. <laughs> I know. With uh, 25 years of experience, I'm sure you <laughs> have, have a lot to say. So I would love to just get into your journey a little bit as um, starting from the entertainment industry and like what led you into starting uh, Mailing Entertainment. Well, Mailing Entertainment, I started actually more than 26 years ago under a different name in Brazil, where right. I'm from. So um, basically what happened is I went to school here to Berkeley for writing and screenwriting. I got an agent. Uh, I got a script that was optioned by Leonardo DiCaprio's company. And I thought, wow, I hit the jackpot. This is fantastic. This is going to be a great career. And that back in uh, 1997, 98. So Titanic, big hit. Yeah. Capra is huge. Um, and it's actually a very cute story. I don't know if you have time for this, but I can tell you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll go into it for sure. Okay, great. Um, so quickly, I was very inexperienced. I was in my early 20s. And I was interning in Party of Five, which was a TV show that I really loved. I was just an intern. Um, and I, on my way there, I was living in San Francisco at that time. On my way there, I heard on the radio, they were announcing this new book called Dreamland. And, you know, as the guy was announcing the ra on the radio, I'm like, I love this story. So I asked the tax driver, instead of dropping me off where he should go, to stop by Barnes & Noble. I bought the book. I started reading it. It's like 700 pages. And I started writing a script right away without even knowing that I had to talk to someone about book rights and, you know, not even my manager at the time. So I spent the next six months almost writing this huge script, which was 180 pages because everything was three hours back then. And then I called my manager and I said, well, I have this script. I love it. I want to send it over. And the first question he made, and that kind of defined my whole career after, was, do you have the book rights? And I'm like, book rights? Am I supposed to have any book rights? I didn't even know. It's like, well, you need the book rights. So I called the... Um, um, the book author's agent and they said oh sorry it has already been optioned and too bad who who did it uh, who did option it and then it was Leonardo DiCaprio's company yeah. because he was looking for a script to talk about New York at some kind of beginning of the 20th century or the beginning of the 16th century he bought all the books about New York period pieces, and this was one of them. So I got my agent, I was very annoying, very nagging. I'm like, call them and say, I have a script because we don't know if they have a script, right? They have the book rights, but what if they can look at this and see, wow, this makes sense as a film um, because the book is like super complex and multiple narratives. And I really like what I did. So I called them and, uh, well, my, my manager called them and said uh, they were willing to look into my script and they ended up optioning it because they liked the script. They didn't have a script. And then, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio went with Gangs of New York. Oh, yeah. 
So it's a Scorsese movie. Also, I didn't know at the time. Otherwise, I would have freaked out even more. <laughs> but it was, it, you know, it, it taught me two lessons. One, look for the book rights, first thing. And uh, two, uh, everything is still possible, even if you don't do it the right way. But if you do it seriously, if you want, if you think the story is worth telling, other people will think it is also, you know, if it's relevant, go for it. Even if the, the book rights are not available, try to negotiate, talk to people, see what happens. Think about long tail because sometimes it's uh, it takes uh, many years. Um, and that's how I started. I started, I went back to Brazil, started my company there and I started consulting and scripts. I was also writing uh, some of my scripts uh, and TV shows. And then I became a book author as well. But always I have, I had this thing of, about helping people yeah. Get it, you know, it done and being able to be in multiple projects at the same time. I'm like, I'm very bored if I have just to write one script for a whole year. So that's why I became a consultant, I think. Yeah. And I would love for you to just kind of talk a little bit about that option in piece, because like for most people, how does that really work in sense like, oh, so we, sometimes we see those big headlines like, oh, this book is getting up for option and you get super excited being in the book world. Like, okay, my favorite book might just become a movie, right? But yeah. sometimes that doesn't always happen. So like, what, how does that process work? Like whether it comes from bidding or when does it, you know, get recycled? I know each contract can t tend to be different, but like just overall your experience in that, in that space. Right, so great question. Um, it depends on the book. You know, the, the main books, the main authors, before they are even released, the agencies release, uh, you know, some kind of uh, piece to the talent agencies who represent directors, producers, distributors, and to the studios. So they have a first look and uh, they can option it uh, firsthand. So, but if you're not mainstream, if you're not a best-selling book author, uh, when you're releasing your first book, let's say, um, then you have to kind of, I think the most important thing our days is to build an IP, which is an intellectual property, not in law. That We have a term that uh, is the same name, IP, which in law means copyrights or uh, protecting your idea uh, and registering your idea. But when we say an IP in the entertainment industry, we refer to some piece uh, of creation that it could be anything, but has already uh, uh, an audience built around it. Meaning, let's say, instead of having a script then you have a fanfic from that script that already has an audience. So the first thing executives are looking for in optioning books or, and we have fanfics that became like big box offices, like um, 50 uh, Shades of Grey. It was a fanfic based on even the Twilight yeah. saga. Um, and then, you know, it's very inexpensive. But instead of just having uh, a manuscript or a script to shop around, you have something that is a step further that is, I already established an audience. Meaning right now it's a podcast. It could be a podcast. It could be a news piece. It could be a stage play. Anything that's not super expensive, but that will prove to the person putting money and the person who should be optioning your book um, AKA buyers, I call them buyers because they're very different people um, that you already have proven your concept and it's already been tested and the audience likes what they're seeing. And of course, the bigger the numbers, the better, but it, it's not because we are in such a niche uh, market it's not really you know a, a deal breaker if you don't have big numbers. Yeah, so, you know, I'm at, more or less. I think that's the dynamics right now. Yeah, of course. And then, so for as an um 
author, like say you, you're like, okay, I do, I may want to um, get my book option and turn into a film. Um, how do you feel about like, how do they work themselves into being a part of the script and all those things as well? Cause, or at least when it comes to your company, how does that usually work? Do you work hand in hand with the author? When yeah. yeah, sorry, it, it depends. And uh, I think what we can guarantee is best efforts in putting you in the writer's room or being part of it. Yeah. A lot of the producers will not want the book writer to be part of the process because adaptation is about letting go of a former structure that does not serve another media and about kind of changing the arrangement of the story. And we all know everybody who write a book, watch the film or a TV series based on that book knows that things are changed and, you know, kind of uh, scrambled around or maybe created, sometimes ignored, some characters are not there. You need to do this because the storytelling for film and TV has a, a you know, a very particular structure that should be respected in order for the audience to keep their attention, yeah. which is very basic. You, you just need to keep the attention. So most of the times the the book author is too you know attached to the book and they don't want to let it go and so I think it's healthy for uh, the book author to just let the adaptation go and and not be part of it um but there is some cases that uh this really happened like uh, what's her name Gillian uh, Gillian Flint Gone Girl, she yeah. was the screenwriter of her own book. And I really applaud her for that. It, it's so hard to tell the same story in two completely different ways and be successful. Uh, so what I tell my clients, if my clients is a book author and we finally get the rights to their book uh, option for TV or film, I say, look, I'm going to put best efforts but I do not recommend you being part of this because it's going to be painful, you know, and maybe that's it. What you get from this is having your book adapted. It's going to sell so much more after the film or TV series comes out. Um, and, and that's already you became anointed by the market. You're already special there, so. Yeah, I would love, and since you have such um, a, a lot, so much experience, I'd love to hear what in your opinion, makes a great story? And what do you look for when you are working with authors? So I think it's, for me, it's all about inspiration. You know, somehow the, the journey, the hero's journey, the main character needs to transform the character so much or in a way that it will inspire both readers and viewers to also... Think about transformation. Think about your better self. And, and that can happen in very subtle ways. It doesn't need to be, uh, you know, like self-help. I'm not talking about this at all. For example, I just watched The Holdovers, which I think is one of the best films of the season, Alexander Payne. And what an inspirational story. Every single character changes a little bit. And, you know, the message is so powerful. It's like family is who we choose. And this is going to resonate with everybody because even people who have families that have strong bonds have also friends and people they chose. So I think that's the most important aspect of uh, a book or a story. And it's like how it touches the audience. And one thing I always say is it's not about your story. It's about who wants to hear or who needs to hear your story. So sometimes book authors, they write because they have a compulsion and they need to put it out there. But if they want that to become an adaptation, they need to take into consideration if they're telling a story that people want to hear and the way they want to hear and it's going to inspire them. So I think it's much more, there is not one type of story that is commercial. 
It's much more um, just having the sensibility of, you know, kind of looking at what the world is needing right now or in yeah. two years, because everything takes at least two years to get to the, the screen. And, and thinking, yeah, this is something I can, you know, because at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, transformation, love, being uh, there for each other. And that those are the big things that, yeah. Yeah. I, I love what you're saying. And, and when we talk, like when we talk about marketing, it's like, what's most personal is most general, right? So sometimes with those stories and when it really, what really hits is just telling an honest and true story and how people were transformed, like you said, through the, whether it's the hero's journey or a different format to see those characters have real um, evolution throughout the story. Um, I, one of the things, so when I, when I first ran into some of your um, content, I loved that you were talking about celebrity like uh, book clubs and how they've kind of um, transform the the space a little bit. I'd love to hear like just your thoughts about those and how they've been able to, especially like a Reese Witherspoon has been able to take a book and now has gotten the option rights and, and turn it into screen adaptions. And then you were talking about IP and all that. So like, I would love to hear just like your thoughts on, on that space as well. Yeah, I think um, what Reese did was really smart because she combined the book club aspect, the reading aspect which is something that when a book is really good, it's forever, you know, within ourselves and we keep thinking about it. So why not expand it into another media? It's it's almost like she took the books and she added a spin-off, which are films and TV series, right? So <clears throat> she looks for books that are already very suited for adaptation and her brilliant idea was just to get the book rights once they are released on the, the, the book club so she can explore. Uh, she's not going to adapt every single book because this, it, this depends on a series of uh, decisions that she cannot make. It's like collective decisions. And one thing that um, I think it's in my client's always mix up a little bit oh is it easier to write a book or to make a film or write a script and have it done it's always easier the book way to start as a book because it is um, a, a media from the individual to an individual so it's for me to you I write and you read uh, while the movie and the, the film industries are the, from the collective to the collective. So, you know, a collective multidisciplinary um, media that depends on hundreds of people to happen. So you cannot control, you cannot control financing. We have a saying that uh, if a script is good enough to survive production, then, you know, thumbs up. <laughs> and so, of course, because it's so many people interfering and that's the movie magic. It's the interference and the collaboration between everybody. So um, I think what, she, what those book clubs did and reading with Jenna and Oprah, yeah. uh, you have so many and you have the smallest bo book clubs that are always very important also, because again, remember we're talking about niche. So if you have your, if you're in, you know, um, I don't know, uh, in a small city in Georgia and you have a book club, be, be a part of it. If you want your book to succeed, that's where you need to start and not trying to send to Hello Sunshine. Start yeah. small, start locally, and then you're going to grow. And even if you have a smaller audience, but the niche and what you're talking about relates to the people who are reading, then you are building an IP. You have audience built around it and executives are most likely to, um, you know, just take into consideration your project and who knows, uh, green light it. Yeah, when you're when you said that, kind of remind me even like how Tyler Perry kind of built his um, his um, company up. He kind of started with his church and he, the women that really love those type of stories and kind of moved on from there and has built that real um, group from uh, just from his own writing and his experiences. And speaking of experiences, I would love to hear about um, just you growing up um, being Brazilian and then also didn't you live in France and all those. So I just would love to hear like 
your multicultural background and how it played into your writing and, and kind of stories you like to tell on? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, great question, because, um, you know, back then people didn't travel so much. So um, I was born in Brazil. I moved to Santa Barbara when I was one year old with my parents. And then we went to France and I was there. I learned how to speak and to write in France. And then I went to Brazil. I didn't even speak Portuguese, which is the local language. So I think that's where I took refuge in books to start with. We're talking about the 70s. So there was no TV or on demand anything. Um, and and it was, uh, yeah, it, it gave me a vision of exactly what you said. You know, if you go locally, you can grow globally because if you move a lot, and you see that people are talking about the same things and in the same way, which yeah. is a, a very important pillar that Joseph Campbell brought about the the way we tell stories throughout times and everywhere. And we have so much in common with people that we have nothing in common with. Uh, but we still, as humans, we tell stories in the same fashion um, and there is an order, you know, there's this, what, what you could call first act, second act, or third act. And, um, everybody has, even when you tell a joke, you have a structure to the joke, otherwise it does not work. Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, just being a child and, and moving around a lot, I had to, the book was my best friend. And so I started to write very young I remember, I think I was eight, maybe nine. Uh, I was back in Brazil and I wrote this uh, Christmas book for my family and my father did, you know, the photocopies and we did some binding with like Scott tape and it was super fun. But well, that was my first book. I was eight. It was a way of uh, expressing myself and not non-verbally because of the languages barriers that I encountered, like changing places and languages but uh, yeah it was very rich for a child also I'm an only child so I didn't have any siblings to be talking yeah. to uh yeah so the books were definitely my best friends yeah I love that and then as far as so you were able to now balance your your business with also being a creative right because you still write and you're an author how have you been able to kind of balance those two uh different spaces like when you're right as much as you are a business person you also need to have those creative outlet um outlets to um do your writing yeah that's really tough with age I feel like it becomes tougher and tougher because the mindset of a creative is silence and introspection and when you're an, an entrepreneur when you have your own company you really need to be on the phone and talking and reaching out and exposing yourself so there is a big conflict um i don't write a lot what i do in terms of screenwriting i usually supervise scripts or script doctors so i work with uh, screenwriters, producers, directors, they come on board just to make sure the film is good to go and it has the right format, the, the right tone. So we work together, which is still uh, very different from just being a creative, although I'm still being creative. Um, and books, uh, it's, it's, uh, I gotta tell you, it's really hard. It's painful to write a book is really painful. And, um, usually I wake up at four 30 and I, I write until six 30. When I have a book, I have to start a new book in March. I want to start, I don't have to, but there is this thing. Call. Yeah. The calling, right. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, and then that's it. That's my, and then after 8 uh, a.m., I am, I put a different hat. Usually when you are an entrepreneur, you have, I feel like I have three hats. The entrepreneur who has the vision, the manager who has to run the company, and the technician who has to write all the stuff and do all the stuff. So usually I do entrepreneur in the morning. And then the two others when I'm like, my energy is really 
uh, smaller uh, I do at uh, uh, PM, you know, because that's, you know, it's just more like calling the bank and sending emails, replying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just about having, you know, knowing how to balance things out, uh, which I don't always know. And most of the time I don't know, but I try. Yeah. You try to find that harmony. Yeah. Um, have you found that it's easier to be like a, a author or a screenwriter in your experience? Or do, I know they both have challenges, but which one has has been easier for you, I guess? I think the process of the process of screenwriting is much easier because it's more technical. It's not about polishing every single word. So as I said, it's a, it's a tool. The script is a tool that you write or a group of people write together for a multidisciplinary um, group who are gonna read. So some people are gonna pay attention in the description. Other people will pay attention uh, in the dialogues. So it's easier because you don't you need to polish every single word and make sure you chose them right. You need to do this for the dialogues basically and have a very strong structure. But uh, writing a book is like, for me, <clears throat> if I could compare, you know, uh, a, a script is a, a pool. It's like swimming in a pool and, uh, a book is writing in an ocean. It's like endless. You never know where you're going. You're like, oh my God, I'm so tired. But still worth doing. No, I love that. That's a good analogy. Um, I would love to hear when you're looking for, so when a client comes to you um, looking for assistance um, in your in, with your company, what principles do you look for? Like, you're like, all right, this person I'm willing to work with, this person I can't. Yeah, that's a great question because uh, I have been experiencing more and more demand, thank God, but from people sometimes that are not aligned with my values or with the things, the stories I feel like I I can help tell. So our days, um, I do, I, I want to talk to everybody, even my program which is a coaching program, Welcome to Hollywood, in which I get people ready to come and, and not ready only on mindset uh, side, but also have their materials ready and formatted correctly for Hollywood. If it's a book, if it's a script, it's a, an idea, everything uh, good to go. And then I give them visibility. So in the visibility side, I have to be uh, very confident that I'm presenting to my buyers, my pool of buyers, my network that I have been working on for more than 26 years now, um, presenting someone who reflects a story that I believe in. And I think it's a good story for the world to, to hear. And so, I, before, let's say, before the pandemic, I still had those, like, a lot of serial killers, true crime, which, to be honest, you know, everybody's drawn to, you know, you start yeah. watching one of those, you're like, I want to see more, I'm like, your addiction, and then I'm like, I don't feel this is right for me anymore, I don't want to represent this kind of stories, I want to represent stories that are more uplifting or you know they don't need to be perfect it's not about happiness it's about again transformation uh but not transforming from uh normal healthy mentally healthy human being into a monster i don't want to tell this kind of story anymore so it needs to fascinate me in a way that i will see an angle that makes sense even if it's for people to you know, like to see the red flags, like, oh, this could be a red flag um, when they meet someone or something, you know, there is a, a awareness um, that is brought up. But yeah, I like to talk to everybody, which, which is very difficult and time consuming because this program has a lot of people coming on board. I want to know every story because I really want to represent only the things that align with my editorial line. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. 
I would love to hear. Um, so you've been in you've been in Hollywood for almost I think you said 26, 27 years now. I would love to hear how you've seen it evolve, especially being a, a woman. I'd love to hear like your experience just in Hollywood and how things have changed and and what what's unique and what's been different now. Oh yeah, a lot ha has changed and you know, although we're still struggling a lot, it's so much better, more diverse, more democratic. Um, first, you know, being a woman, a Latina here was really hard. People didn't, uh, it's not my first language. And to be honest, I do not have a, a mother tongue or a first language because I grew up in a different country. I have the language I speak with my parents, which is Portuguese, but my mind doesn't work in that way. So I had this, people didn't know where Brazil was back 25 years ago they were like do you have crocodiles do you have uh you know like do you do you even have cities do you have buildings and i'm like yeah it's like here it's it's what we used to call the third world uh, yeah. now it's in development and uh it, brazil got much better but also much more violent as everywhere i think uh, from the 80s so more opportunities for sure, I see, and for my clients as well. And the other big change for me is producers, content producers now can be anyone. And that's yeah. also because of social media. And so it's much more interesting if you look at this scenario in a way that people can produce their story can tell their story in many different ways and they're not you know the the old gatekeepers cannot keep the gates anymore that we're not interested in in those stories you know that they're like they want to tell us over and over again we want different narratives and you know, we want uh very uh unique stories uh, but and we also want the rom-com that's there is nothing wrong with the old way of telling stories or, you know, we will still love it, but we want to have more opportunity. And that's something that I think is much, much, much better because we have the opportunity to listen to different stories, to watch different stories and to be the producers of our own stories anybody can make it in hollywood i would never in a million years uh have thought of you know starting a program called welcome to hollywood because it wouldn't make any sense back then but now if you're so we want your story we want that story you know um the the one that nobody told and or the one that people take for granted because they're like oh everybody been there but that's you, know, you being the narrator of your own story is so important and so much more powerful than like a handful of people writing about everything or about you know, a limited amount of things, I want to say. But yeah, it's like if you go back to the literature, you have basically males writing for centuries you have, if you go back to archaeology, you have just white males interpreting everything about our history. And now we have women of color and, and other people uh, just looking at this and saying, well, this, this is not a spear. This is a plant. And men were collecting plants and they're not hunting. So the hunter gathered story, the, our first story. Even our first stories were interpreted by males who have been uh, privileged with education. And, and now we're rewriting this also. So I think it's it's a great time to be alive and telling stories. Um, I would love, since as we're starting to wrap up, I'd love to hear upcoming projects as well as uh, I'd love for you to share about Welcome to Hollywood and anything else that you're working on um, at Malin Entertainment. Well, thank you. Um, so yeah, we have some exciting projects. I cannot talk a lot about them, but we have a project from Colombia, uh, Real Story. I work a lot with real stories because that's the magic. I love it. I love to know that people went through those stories 
and that they can inspire other people. Um, I have uh, a story about a friendship between two uh, males and white males, which I'm like, I would, I didn't think I would do it, be doing this right now. But guess what? There is a different angle on how to, uh, on the male, the re-education of males that is very interesting. So this, those are trends that are popping up, like, and that is not about, um, you know, color or about religion or about territory. Where are we coming from? It's just that men are, I'm sorry, but that's my perception, kind of lost in terms of how to do, how to go about with women. Women change so much and we have a lot of empowerment. But those stories are already being told while the, the male narrative and it's like, what now? What do I do now? Is uh, It's very serious also. So we have those, uh, I think, more symbolic stories. But the most exciting project I have right now is Welcome to Hollywood, which is a coaching program in which, as I said, we have groups, we have uh, modules online that are pre-recorded. The whole thing uh, lasts 12 weeks and it's by invitation only. So people can DM me, can send me an email telling a little bit of their stories. And what we're looking for there is um, to get people in the, um, aligned with the right mindset, the right mindset for Hollywood, which is, failure, be ready to fail because everybody is ready to succeed. But guess what? You only succeed after you fail and you rinse and repeat and you go again and again and again. And nobody said it would be easy. This is in the Bible. So it's like, you know, I don't know why people are looking for the easy way out. Um, so get the right mindset, get their projects, their stories. And I talk a lot about the difference between an idea, a story, and an IP. So get their stories to become an IP that have already a smaller amount of, but some kind of audience uh, built around, uh, around it. So you can take the next step and get visibility. And the way I give visibility uh, in the program, when people are ready, when they did all the steps and their stories are ready to be offered to the market, we have special guests that come on board every three weeks and who are, some of them are really actively looking for new writers, new filmmakers, new screenwriters, new books. And then at the end, we have a newsletter that go, goes out to 2,000 people who are exclusively buyers from all around the world, 200 here in Hollywood who are looking for stories. So I'm putting, you know, uh, my students in touch in front of the right people. And at the same time, I'm, get, I'm preparing them to get there. And that's so cool because I get to scale and to have more people telling more stories and getting a chance of, you know, um, being the biggest storytelling system in the whole world and, and in, in history, which is Hollywood. And yeah. that's why I'm here. No, I love it. And thank you so much uh, for being on the show. We have authors that read our newsletter, so I'll make sure to send it out and I'll let them know where to find you. Um, if you do, if you don't mind, please let us know any place that's best to find you as well as I can put them in the show notes at the end of this podcast. Yeah, for sure. Well, for the newsletter is my website, mailingentertainment.com, but I can write it down for you, M-A-L-I-N, entertainment. Um, and we have our Instagram and LinkedIn accounts also that will direct you to the newsletter. We're launching the newsletter on LinkedIn and every day we publish. It's a bi-weekly newsletter, so you're... Uh, mailbox will not be um, full of us. It, it's just twice a month. And it's a reflection on the market and what's going on. We talk a lot about right, uh, book rights adaptation, but also about, we talked about the strike and screenwriting and everything that's going on in Hollywood in terms of entertainment, literature, uh, film and TV, basically. 
And yeah, and those are the places where you can find me. And and I have my Instagram, which is at Laura Mailing uh, underscore. And I can send it to you. Thank you. Yep, yeah, I'll make sure to put it in the show notes. Laura, it's been a, truly a pleasure to be um, to have this conversation with you. And thank you so much.